Hello councillors, staff and residents viewing via live stream. Good morning all and welcome. I acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the land on which this meeting is being held and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, councillors, uh, we have Councillor Chewy as an apology today. Do we have any other apologies? Okay. Uh, we move on to declaration of conflict of interest. Please just use this opportunity to make public any prescribed conflict of interest or declarable conflict of interest in respect of the items in the agenda. Councillors should use this opportunity to disclose and or comment on other councillors and or staff interests in accordance with the Act and the regulations. Any conflicts to declare, councillors? Councillor Barnes. Uh, yes, Mr Mayor, I've notified the CEO that I have a conflict of interest in 6.4, 6.5. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Millwood. I too have a declarable conflict of interest in items 6.4 and 6.5 and will be leaving that Councillor Farinelli. Um, yes, Mr Mayor, I have a declarable conflict of interest in 6.4 um, and will also leave the room. Any other conflicts? Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I have a declarable conflict of interest in item 6.3 as I am a subject uh, in the resolution. Yeah, through you, Mr Chairman, with your permission, I've uh, received written advice from all of the councillors who have just declared uh, their interests, and I've also uh, received notification uh, from Councillor Chewy, um, who obviously in absentia won't be able to declare her interests today, um, but I've received the appropriate uh, written notification um, in accordance with the requirements under the Act. Thank you, Mr CEO. Okay, we move on to item one, confirmation of minutes. Will somebody move that those minutes are a true and accurate record? Moved by Councillor Purvin, seconded by Councillor Barnes. All in favour? 
carried unanimously. Any business arising from those minutes? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've just got a question for Councillor Baines on um, previous minutes 8.3, crocodile attack. Jeff, um, it's stated here that Councillor Baines advised the management plan needs to be reviewed. Is there an update on that, Councillor? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, we have uh, contacted the appropriate authority and spoken to one of the uh, regional hierarchy. Uh, there is a meeting planned in the near future about the um, possible review of the Crocodile Management Plan. And I will say DES are bringing a big piece forward at the moment. Uh, uh, the state manager, Lindsay Del Zoppo, was interviewed on ABC Radio yesterday talking about um, just making people more croc-wise and more aware. I mean, we know there's been some issues around our boat ramps and people doing food scraps, so I think there's uh, a lot of information out there that, that people need to be made aware of. Thank, thank you, Councillor Baines. Councillor Millwood. Through the Chair, um, I brought up in the last meeting um, about an abandoned car at Jack Drive at Faluga, which is posing an environmental and health hazard and I haven't received any further update on what is happening with this and I would appreciate some prompt um, yeah some prompt Thanks, either ri Norwood. something written or something just to let me know what's happening because I think it really needs some urgent attention thank you thanks Councillor it's an operational matter so I'll go to see you uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with your permission, and uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Millwood. Uh, on receipt of your most recent uh, email, uh, I've reminded uh, our regulatory services staff through Mr. Sadler um, to uh, uh, review the matter, and I will give you the advice as soon as I have it before me. Thank you, Mr. Gott. Any further business arising from the minutes? Ms Bradley. Through the Chair. Um, at our last Council meeting, uh, I presented a 2019-2020 benchmarking report. I'd just like to note a correction in one of the dot points in that report around uh, the revenue generated per roadable property. Um, the revenue generated uh, was in fact $5,143,000 worth of operating revenue and $5,358 worth of operating expenditure per roadable property compared to the average of 5,441 revenue and 5,740 revenue. Thanks, Ms Bradley. That will be noted in the minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further business arising from the minutes? If not, we'll move on to item 3, uh, 3.1, page 24, Eco Destination Certification. And Mr Blanchett will present this report. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, councillors. Morning. Mr Blanchett. Morning. So introducing the report, I'll take the report as read and um, just give you a quick oversight to Eco Destination Certification. So this is a program that is run by Ecotourism Australia. It's a globally recognised program and it's, uh, it needs to be for a clearly defined boundary, hence a local government area boundary qualifies well. And it's a program worked closely with your tourism industry. So a partner in this with us is Tropical Coast Tourism. Why uh, the value of the program for destinations is that it provides a strong, well-managed destination. It highlights high quality experiences, provides us with credible, authentic experiences, and it's verified. It's not just us saying it. So while Kasri Coast is world class, we're 70% national park and world heritage areas and we're fringed by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park with 30 islands in that marine park, 30 plus islands. We're not officially recognised as eco certified and this is what this program will do for the Kasri Coast. Uh, there are several destinations in Australia going for this program now. There's only one certified at the moment. So it's an opportunity for the Kasri Coast to use it as a framework as a sustainable destination, which means sustainable practices aren't all about nature. 
Sustainable practices of the destination involve environmental, social and economic sustainability. And that's the difference with the program, so it's sustainable as well as considerate of nature. We've started on the journey. It's a 12 to 18 month journey. And the ultimate goal is the eco destination status. A benefit of this journey is there's two other levels of certification we can achieve on the way. One is a nature destination qualification. And hopefully sooner than that, we'll soon meet criteria to be in the top 100 sustainable destinations in the world. This short term goal will put us on the world stage. It will get announced at the biggest tourism conference in the world in Germany. And Castry Coast will get announced with other destinations that have made the top 100. Um, the start of the journey, we, Ecotourism Australia, have come and presented to council uh, a few times, a CEO on the program. And uh, the program manager was actually in region recently. And we've managed to have an audience of over 30 of uh, Kasri Coast community and businesses at meetings held in Innisfail, Carwell and Mission Beach. And this engaged not only tourism industry, we had um, businesses not directly in tourism participating. And we had environmental organisations there such as C4 and... Um, a very motivating participation from traditional owners, including a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Garrigan, and um, their interest in the program is very motivating at this early stage. Uh, as I say, we're working with Tropical Coast Tourism, which is key for our tourism industry and our businesses to be engaged. We have had a preliminary assessment, so we've had an early measure of how the Cassidy Coast is going. So. Um, In that early measure, it's assessed and pulled together a lot of the great work of our colleagues and council in the sustainability area. So this is recognising uh, water and waste programs and environmental programs that council has done and over time and reported on. Uh, the detail of that has been pulled together in this report so it can be recognised. We're 50% of the way there um, at this early stage. And 36% of what was measured, we're partially there. So now we will hands on with, with uh, my colleague Thea Orman and Carbell. Thea and I will be correlating the rest of the data with their support across council and community to tick off the rest of those boxes and get our ZECO certified. So that's a quick summary of the report. And um, I just propose that Council resolve to note the report. Thanks, Mr. Blanchard. Council, is any comments? Uh, Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure yesterday of being at a Reef Guardian Council's working group meeting, um, and they're in, under our Reef Guardian action plans. Uh, councils identify many of the good works that they already do. Uh, this council does some amazing work around uh, water management, waste management, the solar energy program. Um, we brought up with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority that Cassery Coast is moving towards ecotourism accreditation and the, we gave a quick explanation on the benefits and how it rolls into, as Mr Blanchett just informed us, the broader community as well and uh, they asked me to pass my congratulations on if this is endorsed today, Mr Mayor, that it's a great step towards um, uh, the ecotourism destination, but also strengthening our position as a Reef Guardian Council and leaders in the region. Thank you, Councillor Baines. Uh, Councillor Farinelli. Um, through the Chair and to the Councillors, I think this is great to see um, us progressing so well in this ecotourism space. Um, It is definitely one of the potential three pillars that I'm proposing for Council as far as our tourism future and I see it to play a, a significant um, part in, in the way we um, promote this region and, and welcome people to our area in the future. So well done and I have no doubt at all that we will achieve this very well under your leadership, Mr Blanchett. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Farinelli. Any further comments, questions? If not, somebody move. You want so moved move moved by Councillor Baines, seconded by Councillor Farinelli. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Blanchett. Thank you, uh, move on to item four, asset sustainability, 4.1 page 40, the second round of asset rationalisation process. And Mr. Accatino will present this report. Good morning, all. Good morning. Mr. Accatino. Um, so the report in front of you is uh, um, it's the second list of uh, um, assets for recommendation for rationalisation. So this is a um, continuation from the report that went up on the 21st of um, January. So this is the second round. So basically these, the list that's in front of you today is um, they all have gone through that asset rationalisation process. So we've gone through, done the community engagement through the community consultation group. Uh, where they've looked at all, all the assets, they've gone through that process of scoring them, looking at through that flagging system as identified previously. Um, so a lot of these assets on this list were things that identified were needing a little bit more work needed to be done on them, hence why they weren't in that first round. Um, so we've done our due diligence, talked to user groups um, and formed our um, recommended rationalisation approach which is um, consistent with our uh, principles for the community use of assets. Um, so the recommendation on, on here is to um, is to go through, um, is to support the rationalisation of these assets and based on the recommended ra rationalisation approach as identified in the report. Thank you Mr Coutinho. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Farinelli. Uh, just a comment. Um, I think, yeah, it need, doesn't it need. Oh, well, I want to say again, the amazing work you're doing in this space, um, and the um, the fact that council seems to be committed to a future and 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 progressing with this. Um, I really have nothing more to say than other than to move the motion, and um, yeah, go with up yeah. with this again. Moved by Councillor Farinelli, seconded by Councillor Millwood. Any further comments, councillors? Uh, yes, also very well done. Just very quickly for those people who haven't got the agenda in front of them, um, rationalisation means we're not going to knock them all down. If I could just read something quickly, yep. or Mr Acatino may, this means like transfer of ownership, selling the building, set up a lease agreements with clauses, change the end of life, uh, re remove the asset or replace or fit out with new assets, uh, increased usage through shared arrangements, just to make it clear what rationalisation means. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Any further comments? Uh, I just want to report back to our staff on round one. Um, on the weekend, there was a working bee at the Old Fishing Club, and uh, Innisfail Creatives and the Feast of the Senses uh, have cleaned that building out now, uh, ready to relocate to a uh, destination of uh, choice. Uh, you've offered them three new homes that actually have water connected and toilet facilities, which is what they didn't have in the fishing club building. So uh, it's win-win. It's uh, Council is getting an opportunity to uh, look at that asset now, empty, and uh, the clubs have found a new home which is a lot more um, palatable to their members because, uh, like I said, where they were, there wasn't even a toilet facility there. So uh, it's happening. Uh, it's good news. Uh, and of course, it's it's a in kind support. Uh, council supplied a skip bin to help those two clubs move their rubbish out and any anything that was uh, required to go to the dump. So uh, just wanted you to know it, it's it's starting to happen. Uh, and uh, feedback in general is very positive about the process. People are aware that Treasury told us six years ago this has got to happen. Uh, and and the fact is that a lot of our leases have lapsed. Uh, so we have a legal responsibility also to get leases and uh, management agreements up to speed. Uh, but um, great work. I know there's a small team on the ground, uh, you and uh, Peter McBride and uh, uh, Justin Fisher. Uh, so you are doing great work. Uh, this is the next round and uh, we'll wait for your next report back on how things progress with these, uh, these groups and uh, the consultation, the one-on-one -on -one uh, discussions that you're having with them, but it's, it's going extremely well at the moment. So congratulations, Chris. Thank you. All right, we have a mover and a seconder. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item five, major projects. 
5.1, page 94, uh, Port Hinchinbrook Sewerage Proposal, and Mr Bradford will represent this report. Welcome, Mr Bradford. Good morning, councillors. Good morning, Ms Mayor. Mr Bradford. Um, through the Chair today, I wanted to present a um, follow-up report to the January 21 um, report regarding a state government offer for the long-term solution for Port Hinchinbrook sewerage and a number of other assets. So following that decision in, gen in January, um, the state has now provided a, um, a new offer. The new offer um, is, has a number of similarities to the previous offer, um, but there is some differences as well. So it's in, so um, the new offer from the state relates to um, the, the state providing $6.3 million towards um, the project, the council providing, um, providing the balance, which we estimate is $2 million towards the project. The project is specifically for the Gandon design um, for the sewage treatment plant and um, that'll form the basis of the project. Um, the council is acknowledging that the state will provide no further support or financial assistance in relation to Port Hinchinbrook. Um, that council will acquire the STP land um, and existing STP assets, and that council will acquire the road land um, and proceed to dedicate it to road reserve um, under the Lands Act. So similarly, um, so some of the key differences from the previous previous offer from the state um, is the funding has increased from 4.3 million to 6.3 million. Um, however, the, the acquisition and administration costs which the state um, had, had indicated that they would contribute towards in the previous proposal um, are now actually included in that 6.3 million. Um, the construction process is entirely managed by council. Um, there was some support from the state previously. Um, and additional um, state government support is not provided um, throughout the project. So it'd be a lot more similar to a normal grant um, of grant procedure. Some of the um, key aspects that the officers have identified um, are not included. Um, that need to be considered uh, by council in making a decision in responding to this offer. Um, is the unknown state of the subterranean assets within the road reserves. Um, such as stormwater and water articulation network. Um, the funding is limited to cover a share of the construction of the sewage treatment plant and does not extend um, to the sewage reticulation network um, or road assets. Uh, the projects, because um, of the Gannon design, it's limited strictly to the Port Hinchinbrook um, solution and um, does not really offer um, or give consideration to a potential water application um, to, to, to extensions of Port Hinchinbrook um, and potentially um, with further, con further consultation, Cardwell. Um, there's no allowance for the irrigation dis disposal um, land, which is required. Currently, the 500 EP plant um, is the irrigation land suitable for the, for the current demand, um, but should the dem demand on the plant increase towards the 500 EP, um, capacity, um, additional land would need to be sourced. Um, and also there's no allowance for the ongoing operational costs. So council should consider whether to accept the offer, um, reject the offer, or um, accept the offer subject to conditions as set by council. So the design of the STP is a 500 EP plant, um, which would cater to the 200 EP plant. That is um, the same as the previous offer. Um, the roads um, a, are a, um, it doesn't, there's no allowance for the roads um, and the other subterranean assets and any works that needs to be done to those assets and um, that is a risk that council needs to consider when making a decision today. Also the unknown costs around the council acquisition of the acquisition of the assets um, is another consideration that should be considered. On the flip side of not proceeding, um, with with this with this offer um, is is the consideration around the um, lack of appropriate ongoing sewage treatment and also um, the risk to the wider community. The continued political risk around the inaction um, also of a failed private estate on the doorstep of the Cassery Coast as well. So the financial implications, um, a key one is around 
the cost of operating this sewage treatment plant should Council take it on in its current form um, would see um, ratepayers within that community paying $3,000 a year in ongoing sewage utility charges. The, in regards to the ongoing operational costs for other assets as a part of this um, project, the roads, the stormwater, the curb and channeling, major drainage structures and water reticulation. Um, just in depreciation alone, it's expected to be around $125,000 a year additionally annually. Um, and the operation and maintenance costs would be in the order of around half a percent of general rates for the wider community. So today the consideration, um, the recommendation from officers is to consider the proposal from the Department of State Development, Tourism and Innovation uh, for the acquisition um, of the land outlined in Schedule 1 of the report, um, being for the, the sewage treatment plant, um, the land for road purposes and um, within the Port Hinch and Brook Estate. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr Bradford. Uh, Councillors, any comments, questions? Councillor Barnes. Uh, good. <clears throat> Firstly, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I've put a lot of research into this and have put my motion in writing, of which I'll be giving to the councillors very shortly. <clears throat> and I've checked with councillors solicitors off my own back and at no cost to council, and they've assured me that it's not unlawful, this motion. So, Mr Mayor, if you just bear with me a minute and hand this around. Right, just as that's getting handed around, um, Mr Mayor, I'd like to move that the Council propose to Queensland Treasury that the offered funding is accepted related to the acquisition and construction of a new sewage treatment plant for Port Hinchinbrook Estate. The acceptance of the funding is conditional upon Council being provided with sufficient additional funds to complete the entire project the liquidator providing the land necessary for construction of the sewage treatment plant at no cost or minimal cost acceptable to council up to 1500 EP. Sufficient land being provided to council to allow disposal of effluent at the maximum capacity of the sewage treatment plant up to 1500 EP. The requirement that council take responsibility for the internal accesses referred to as roads being removed at this time. Council being satisfied that the proposal will not negatively impact upon the balance of the Cassery Coast ratepayers. Council's engineers have the capacity to influence the design to provide for the possibility of a future expansion. Latent liabilities being underwritten by the state and or federal government any contracts entered into by the way of this resolution complying with the relevant legislation and that apart from the sewage treatment plan issue, the balance of the conformed deed be preserved. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Are you moving that? I'll be moving that. Okay. Somebody second that, please. Seconded by Councillor Farinelli. Councillors, any comments or questions? If not, put it to vote. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that, Councillor Barnes uh, we, and Mr Bradford. Uh, we now move on to item um, 5.2, and I move that this matter be deferred for a later date. Somebody second that? Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Millwood. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Bradford. We move on to item 6, Governance, Environment and Finance, 6.1, page 107 the uh, financial report for February, and Miss Bradley will present this report. Great work. Welcome again. Thank you. Good morning, Miss Bradley. Good morning. So this morning we have in front of you our finance report and our monthly, monthly council reporting package as at the 28th of February. So Council adopted uh, the 2021 budget on the 7th of July 2020. The RB1 budget review was then adopted on 12th of November 2020 
and the RB2 budget review was then uh, adopted on the 25th of February 21, which is what is reflected in these reports. So Council tracks our year-to-date revenue and expenditure costs across all departments, programs uh, and by services. Uh, it also includes financial statistical data as well, um, highlighting our operations. So some of the key summaries um, up until the 28th of February include our operational revenue currently sitting at 86.8 million, which is 50k under budget um, in comparison to the budget of 56.9 million. Operating expenditures sitting at 62.1 million, which is 2.3 million under budget compared to the year-to-date budget of 64.4. End of month cash balance uh, was sitting at 56.1 million due to the rates discount period ending. Capital expenditure for the month totaled 2.4 million and year to date capital expenditure including commitments totaled 33.8 million uh, which is 47% uh, in comparison to the full year budget excluding commitments and 64% including commitments. So the operating performance you can see in the first table. Um, the operating result year to date currently sitting at 24.7 million versus a budget of 24.1 million. So currently we're 589,000 ahead of budget. Our measures of financial sustainability include our operating surplus ratio sitting at 28.47 million, which is slightly above the targeted range due to the timing of when rates revenues received. Uh, and Council's expenditure obviously will continue over the next few months. Asset sustainability um, currently sitting above or within the target range above 90% at 94% for the month. Net financial liabilities ratio sitting at minus 58.01 which is also within the targeted range. The next table gives you um, information on our financial results. Um, the key things to note here are our fees and charges currently tracking 128,000 over budget due to increased rate searches. Uh, increased building inspections and animal registrations. Uh, interest, uh, as we're aware, is whilst we did bring back the budget in RB, RB2, um, we are still sitting under budget by 260,000 uh, due to lower than anticipated interest rates and we'll continue monitoring that budget risk uh, as the year progresses. Operating grants, uh, currently tracking 254,000 over budget. Uh, due to works for Queensland funding that was received in relation to projects completed in the prior financial year, as well as the receipt of the second payment for the Coastal Adaptation Strategic Plan. Employee expenses, um, currently tracking 1.3 million under budget due to vacant positions, as well as the timing of payroll posting uh, has impacted that figure a lot this, this month. Materials and services, uh, currently tracking 1.07 million under budget uh, due to the timing of invoices for contractor services, external consultants, uh, legal fees and reduced fuel costs. Depreciation um, is currently tracking over budget by 339000 uh, mainly relating to water and sewerage and our intangible assets in information services. Capital contributions are uh, currently over budget um, due to developer contributions and contributed assets uh, from the new dressing rooms constructed at Calendar Park. Uh, and then our gain and loss on asset disposals. Uh, so we've got our sale of fleet items included in there, offset by the loss on disposal due to the timing of completion of capital projects and the capitalisation process. Investment performance. Um, so of the 56.1 million we had at the end of the month, um, we had an average interest rate of 0.63%, um, which isn't fantastic, um, but could be a lot worse. Um, so you can see in that table there uh, where our funds have been distributed across. Uh, capital projects, so uh, we, as you recall we reduced our capital budget uh, in the last budget review down to 52.14 million. Year to date capital expenditures currently totalling 24.7 million and commitments at just over 9 million, um, giving us the 47.49% um, completion of the budget. So management identify and monitor budget risks that have the potential to impact our current and future budget performance and some of the areas that we are still monitoring and will be looking to mitigate in the next budget review include Port Hinchinbrook sewerage related expenditure, uh, depreciation um, and interest on investments. 
These are anticipated to be offset by un an underspend in employee expenses and increased revenue associated with the Works for Queensland grant funding as well as JobKeeper rebates. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms Bradley. Um, any comments or questions, councillors? Councillor Barnes? <coughs> Good, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yes, Leah, you've just mentioned that my question in the budget risks there, Port Hinchinbrook sewage related expenses and um, can you just talk on those three dot points a little bit more? Certainly. You've got three in a row there. So Port Hinchinbrook sewage related expenditure um, has to do with what we've spent year to date operating the sewage facilities uh, down in Port Hinchinbrook, uh, which I believe is sitting around 130000 um, obviously that we haven't received the revenue for that that we had budgeted for, therefore that's been highlighted as a budget risk. Um, depreciation, so we had a revaluation of our water and sewerage assets last financial year, um, which has meant a significant increase in our depreciation moving into this financial year, which due to the timing of when those reports were finalised last year weren't included in this budget. Um, in relation to our intangible assets, uh, we brought on um, one of our software programs um, last financial year as an intangible asset rather than recognising it as an operating expense. So that has also increased the depreciation during this financial year, which we'll need to take into consideration as we move into next year's budget. Um, and interest on investments, I think we've spoken, yeah. unless there's any further questions. Any further questions, councillors? Uh, somebody moved the report be received and noted. Moved by Councillor Baines, seconded by Councillor Millwood. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item 6.2, page 122, policy review, asset accounting, and Miss Bradley will present this report. Good morning. Good morning again. <laughs> Um, so regularly reviewing our policies and procedures um, keeps councillors, council staff and other stakeholders up to date with regulations, technology and industry best practices. So this report provides an outline of the proposed amendments uh, for our asset accounting policy, our disposal of assets policy and our portable and attractive items policy. So in our asset accounting policy, um, so this Policy itself provides guidance, clarity and consistency regarding the treatment of our capital expenditure, depreciation, revaluations, disposals and acquisitions that provide a greater understanding um, and accuracy of Council's capital reporting requirements. So Council originally adopted this policy in October 2019 and the second version um, of the policy has further refined what we have in there, including uh, expanding on the new lease standards that were implemented last financial year. Uh, update to some of the attachments uh, around our capitalised versus ex operational expense costings, um, the, which asset classes are to be carried at cost in accordance with our ASB 116, uh, also uh, the schedule of valuation for our revaluation dates uh, for our assets that need to rotate every five years, uh, as well as the addition of attachment D which is, uh, includes our impairment of assets. So the second policy is our asset disposal policy. Um, so this was originally adopted in 2015 um, and then amendment adopted in 2018 with reference to accounting standards. And this is the third version of the policy that we're putting forward. Um, so only minor amendments in this one. Um, so just relating to clearer definitions of personnel required to authorise asset disposals and alignment of the definitions um, to our asset accounting policy which is our, our, our main policy in this space. The third policy we have here is our portable and attractive items policy. Uh, so this was adopted in 2018 um, and it gives guidelines on the treatment and reporting methods of our portable and attractive items. Um, these items are items that are particularly susceptible to theft or loss due to their nature and value. Um, and this is the second version of that policy also. The amendments in that policy uh, just relate to the custodian and direct supervisor definitions which weren't included that have now been added for clarity, um, as well as the maintenance of portable and attractive items register, ensuring that's included in there. Happy to take any questions there might Thank be. Thank you Ms Bradley. Any questions or comments? Councillor Millwood? Through the Chair. Good morning Leah. Good morning. Um, so you did just say that there is a register for all the portable and active attractive items so yes. that's just like a, as if there was a catalogue? Effectively, yes. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Any further questions, councillors? If not, would somebody move the recommendation? Councillor Bain? So moved. Uh, 
Moved by Councillor Bain, seconded by Councillor Barnes. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Thank you. Move on to item 6.3, page 171. Councillor's request for leave of absence. Mr. Gott. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have uh, application. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. <coughs> oh, um, I do beg your pardon. No, that's fine. I will leave the room for this one. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, through you, Mr Chairman, I note that uh, Councillor Baines, having previously declared his uh, interest, uh, has uh, uh, left the room, will take no part in the discussion um, or the vote on this particular item. Uh, through you, Mr Chairman, uh, we have, and I also note that Councillor Chewy is not in the room, so um, is not otherwise conflicted. Um, Councillor uh, Baines uh, has requested leave uh, for a uh, period from Friday the 16th of April to Saturday 24th, uh, 24th of April inclusive uh, and Councillor Chewy has requested leave of absence be granted for the period Sunday 28th of February uh, through to Thursday 11th of March inclusive um, and it's quite simply put Mr Chairman, my recommendation that Council provide or that Council uh, resolve to uh, provide leave of absence to both of those councillors. Uh, thank you, Mr God. Uh, would somebody move that recommendation? Moved by Councillor Farrett. Uh, question? Yep. Um, before I move, I will move it, um, but I just wanted to point out that we're actually approving leave that's already been carried out. Yes. So, yeah, okay, and I will move that. Thank you, Councillor Farinelli. Seconded by Councillor Millwood. All in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. We move on to item 6.4, page 173, uh, alleged inappropriate conduct. Uh, we and actually, before you leave, before everybody oh. Councillor Barnes. Hang on. And Please. Councillor, before you leave the... Oh, yeah. um, through, through you, Mr. Chairman, if I may, this is the one where um, I'm sorry, Councillor Farinelli. Uh, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is uh, the uh, item uh, wh which will uh, provide for Councillor Barnes, Councillor Millwood, and Councillor Farinelli uh, to remove themselves from the meeting room, take no part in the discussion or the decision uh, in the absence of Councillor Chewy. Uh, that would leave council in a position uh, without quorum. Uh, so it's my recommendation um, that the council re resolve to uh, uh, delegate the uh, decision in respect of item 6.4 alone. At 6.5, Councillor Farinelli will rejoin the meeting and therefore uh, quorum will be re-established. So uh, on that basis, it's my suggestion, uh, with respect, Mr. Chairman, that you might ask the councillors to, at first, resolve uh, pursuant to, uh, from memory, section 257. Kelly's nodding at me. Uh, section 257 of the local government act that the decision be uh, delegated to you, Mr. Mayor. Would somebody move uh, those uh, that recommendation? Moved by Councillor Baines. Yes, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Councillor Purvin. Uh, all in favour? Carried unanimously. Okay. Um, so I note that the councillors are now um, removing themselves from, from the room, Mr Chair. Okay. The recommendation uh, that council consider the contents of the investigation report, N1, determine whether or not council agrees with the analysis provided within the report in deciding whether Councillor Barry Barnes has engaged in inappropriate behaviour, and two, if Council decides that Councillor Barry Barnes has engaged in inappropriate behaviour, determine what action Council will take under Section 150AH to discipline Councillor Barry Barnes. I'll hand over to Ms Slattery to present her report. Okay. So in terms of background, uh, in September last year, the Office of the Independent Assessor received complaints about the conduct of Barry Barnes during a council information session on the 4th of June 2020 and the 9th of September 2020. Uh, following a preliminary assessment, the OIA 
concluded that the complaint, if proven, involved inappropriate conduct. The OIA referred the complaint to Council to be dealt with uh, and included a recommendation that the conduct be referred to one of the panel of external investigation providers provided by the OIA to investigate the matter and to make recommendations to the local government in relation to whether inappropriate conduct is made out and if so, what would be the appropriate range of sanctions to be made. So Ashdale, which was one of the panel of external investigation providers identified by the OIA, were appointed by council to investigate the complaint. The investigation has now concluded and an investigation report prepared by Ashdale has been provided to appropriate councillors on a confidential basis. In accordance with the council's investigation policy around conduct of councillors and the principles of natural justice, uh, Councillor Barry Barnes has been told of the case against him, including the evidence obtained, and was provided with an opportunity to put his case in writing, which he has done. In terms of the officer's report, we give a background, um, the allegations, the potential breach, evidence gathered, a summary of the investigator's analysis and the investigators' recommendations. In terms of the summary of the investigators', investigators analysis, uh, one allegation was unsubstantiated and one was substantiated. The allegation that was unsubstantiated was that on the 4th of June 2020, prior to the commencement of a council information session, Councillor Barnes behaved inappropriately when another councillor asked for him if it was true that he was telling people that he was going to shut up two other councillors and he responded that he had told a few people and he would do it. So that allegation has been unsubstantiated based on the balance of probability by the investigator. The allegation that has been substantiated by the investigator is that on the 9th of September 2020, Councillor Baines behaved inappropriate, inappropriately during a... Sorry, Barnes, my apologies. Thank you, Ms. Slatter. I apologise. Um, during a councillor information session, when after another councillor made a comment while he was speaking, he responded that he had had enough of that councillor butting in and that she was nothing but a rude woman. Uh, that allegation was substantiated. In terms of the investigator's recommendation, the investigation report provided the follow up recommendation. Um, is that, that this report be submitted to Council for consideration, which it has been done, um, and that for Council to decide whether or not the subject councillor had engaged in appropriate conduct. Um, it was also recommended in accordance with the Council's investigation policy that the subject councillor be provided with an opportunity put, to put his case in writing, um, which, he, which he has done. Should the council agree with the analysis by the investigator, then the following finding is made, that on the 9th of September 2020, Councillor Barnes behaved inappropriate, inappropriately during a council information session when he described another councillor as a rude woman after another councillor interrupted him while he was speaking. Should the council determine that the subject councillor has engaged in appropriate conduct, the following factors were considered relevant to the council's consideration of the appropriate order. There's been no previous recorded incidences of inappropriate conduct by the subject councillor. The subject councillor admitted the allegation and cooperated with the investigation. While the conduct was reckless, there appears to be no degree of provocation. The subject councillor demonstrated insight regarding a more appropriate response that he should have made, and the subject councillor was experienced and has had relevant, received relevant training conduct regarding the code of conduct. If the council finds that the subject councillor has engaged in inappropriate conduct, then the following consideration of, of the OIA's inappropriate conduct disciplinary action guideline, the below disciplinary action is recommended. An order that a reprimand be recorded against the subject councillor for the conduct and or an order that the subject councillor reimburse a local government for 25% of the costs arising, arising from the inappropriate conduct. Thank you, Ms Lowry. Given that this matter has been uh, referred to me to make a decision on, um, I'll go to the two dot points. Uh, an order that a reprimand be recorded against the subject councillor for the conduct and or uh, I strike that out and I'll go for the second dot point. 
and order that the subject councillor reimburse the local government for 25% of the costs arising from the subject councillor's inappropriate conduct. In, in so far as I have found that the OIA's uh, recommendation uh, is um, just. It's carried. Uh, it's your decision, Mr. Yep. Chairman, so that will be recorded in yep. the minutes. Okay. Um, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'll go and uh, fetch uh, Councillor Farinelli. Yep. Okay, we move on to item 6.5, alleged inappropriate conduct by Councillor Barry Barnes and over to Ms Slattery to present her report. Okay. So by way of background, uh, on the 18th of September 2020, the OIA, or the Office of the Independent Assessor, received a complaint about the conduct of Councillor Barry Barnes during a conversation with Tully Sugar Limited. Following a preliminary assessment, the OIA concluded that if the complaint, if proven, involved inappropriate conduct. The OIA referred the complaint to council to be dealt with and included a recommendation that the conduct be referred to one of the panel of external investigation providers provided by the OIA to investigate the matter and to make recommendations to the local government. Ashdale was appointed, to council, appointed by council to investigate the complaint the investigation has now concluded and an investigation report prepared by Ashdale has been provided to the appropriate councillors on a confidential basis. In accordance with the council's investigation policy and the principles of natural justice, uh, Councillor Barry Barnes has been told of the case against him, including evidence obtained and was provided with the opportunity to put his case in writing, which he has done, and it's been provided to the appropriate councillors. Councillors to decide today whether or not Councillor Barry Barnes engaged in inappropriate conduct and if so, what actions council should take to discipline the councillor. Uh, contained within the report is the allegations, the potential breach evidence gathered, uh, a summary of the investigator's analysis um, and the investigator's recommendations. Uh, it's important to note uh, for councillors if they want to discuss the contents of the investigation report or the written response by Councillor Barry Barnes, um, the councillor is obliged to close the meeting first uh, prior to that discussion taking in place. In terms of the allegations, uh, there were two allegations. One was substantiated, one was unsubstantiated based on the evidence gathered and based on the balance of probability. The first allegation uh, that was substantiated is in, on, in or around September 2020, Councillor Barnes behaved inappropriately when in relation to a prospective employment of a councillor's spouse, spouse by Tully Sugar. He told Tully Sugar to be careful regarding that person and that he had a lot of trouble with that councillor's spouse. So that was substantiated. Uh, the allegation that was not substantiated was that in an, around September 2020, Councillor Barnes behaved inappropriately when he misused information he received within Council to seek to influence the prospective employment of the Councillor's spouse with TSL, Tully Sugar Limited. In terms of the recommendations um, by the investigator, uh, the inve investigation was to provide the report to Council uh, for their consideration into determining whether or not inappropriate behaviour has occurred and if so what disciplinary action should be taken, which is what's, what's happening today. Um, it, was a, it was recommended that the subject Council be provided with the opportunity to put his case in writing, uh, which has, has occurred. If Council agrees with the analysis, then the following finding is made that in or around September 2020, Councillor Barnes behaved inappropriately when in relation to the prospective employment of a councillor's spouse by Tully Sugar, he told Tully Sugar to be careful regarding the councillor's spouse. Should the councillor determine that the subject councillor has engaged in inappropriate conduct, the following factors were considered relevant to the council's consideration of the appropriate order. There was no previous recorded instances of the subject councillor's engagement in inappropriate conduct. 
The conduct involved inappropriate and potential harmful comments about another person. The, the conduct appeared to be deliberate or reckless and the subject counsellor demonstrated no insight into the inappropriate nature of his conduct. And the subject counsellor is experienced and has received rele relevant training regarding the code of conduct. If the council finds that the subject counsellor has engaged in inappropriate conduct, then the following considerations of the OIA's inappropriate conduct disciplinary action guideline, the below disciplinary action is recommended. An order reprimanding the subject counsellor for the conduct, an order that the subject conduct attend training or counselling addressing his conduct, an order that the subject counsellor reimburse the local government for 35% of the costs arising from the inappropriate conduct. Thank you, Ms. Slattery. Councillors, I'll go to the recommendation. There are two dot points. First one, determine whether or not council agrees with the analysis provided within the report in deciding whether Councillor Barry Barnes has engaged in appropriate behaviour. And two, if council decides that Councillor Barry Barnes has engaged in inappropriate behaviour, determine what action council will take under section 150AH to discipline Councillor Barry Barnes. Uh, Ms Slattery has just read out the penalty that's been recommended by the OIA. Would somebody be prepared to move the recommendation? I'll move that, Mr Mayor. Moved by Councillor Bain, seconded by... Seconded by... Seconded by Councillor Purvin. Uh, you want to say something, Councillor Farinelli? Yep. Um, I just, through the Chair, want to question whether um, our policy that we introduced back on the 21st of January is triggered by this um, situation. Uh, the policy is CCRC 003 provision of legal assistance for employees and counsellors. Um, is it not triggered by this situation, um, given that a investigation by an external group has been carried out? Um, and I just wanted to know whether it falls within this policy. The policy was adopted on the 21st of January and relates to expenses around investigations. And I've read the policy. Um, what's interesting to me is back when we started looking at, because this was originally going to be on the agenda and then pulled, and I actually printed off a copy of the provision of legal assistance for employees and counsellors back um, early February this year. Um, it's a seven-page document uh, resolved by Council on the 21st of January. When I actually went in to have a look for that policy again last night, it's been replaced by the previous policy, which was adopted on the 28th of February 2009. It um, raises a few questions for me. Why is the policy the, yeah. the policy that was adopted on the 21st of January no longer present on Council's website, but the old policy is. Um, I questioned myself and went back and had a look at the agenda back on the 21st, and it showed the um, draft uh, policy with the red ink and everything on there. Um, so I definitely didn't print it off from there. I printed off the adopted policy on the 21st of, that was adopted on the 21st of January early in February, it's no longer there and has been replaced. Can I just can I just respond to that first, yep. if that's all right, Councillor Baranelli? So, um, yeah, look, at the moment, we've just switched um, our back-end platform of our website, so we are experiencing some anomalies like that where we've seen old policies being put up, So, at, and that's just happened a couple of days ago, so we're actually going through the process of checking all our documentation okay. on our website, so it's... It's, yeah, it's, it's just something that happened accidentally. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so luckily for me, I actually had a copy of the, um, the current policy. Um, and in there it says the findings, uh, refers to the finding, findings of a court, tribunal inquiry, regulatory investigation or other similar independent body may form the basis of determination of a finding that an employee or counsellor did not act in good faith. Um, it also, in the policy, talks of uh, option, there's 10, item 10 in the policy, repayment of legal representation 
costs, an employee or councillor whose legal representation costs have been paid by the council but must repay all of those legal representation costs to the council under the following circumstances. A, all where all or part of those legal representation costs were subject to determination made under clause nine, which I'll go back to soon, or where a councillor is subject to any finding of misconduct or inappropriate conduct. Um, when I go back to nine, um, I can't find where I've just found a determination, conditions which may be imposed, determ determination um, may be made, but only on a basis of a consideration with the findings of a court tribunal inquiry, regul regulatory investigation or other similar independent body. So I just wonder, um, I guess the question is, um, it, Ashdale may not have been aware of this policy when making the determination to only apply the 35% um, and whether under this policy, whether this supersedes that decision and in actual facts, 100% um, of the court of the investigation should be covered. Yeah, through, are you happy to answer that question or would you prefer me to, Mr. Three, Mr. Chairman? Um, the, you might be. At first blush, and I'd like to uh, review it further, but at first blush, Councillor Farinelli, my understanding is that uh, Councillor Barnes wasn't uh, provided with any uh, legal assistance, that there were no costs associated uh, with uh, legal assistance being provided to him. Um, there's nothing within the material I've read which would suggest that that was the case, um, nor am I aware that um, Council's insurers have provided uh, or, or that uh, any legal costs have been incurred by council at all, so um, the answer to that would be that um, no, there's no legal costs to be recovered. Yeah. Councillor Farinelli. Just, okay, that's, I, I, I assumed that that may be the case. Um, so just to, I've got to say that when adopting that policy, I must have totally un misunderstood it because I thought if a councillor had behaved and, and been found to um, have you know, engaged in inappropriate conduct, then they'd be footing the bill. I mean, I know I will be facing this no doubt soon and um, I would be quite happy to pay 100% of the cost if that was the case. But if you're saying that um, it does not get covered off by this policy, then I accept that. Um, but it just, yeah. Uh, through you, Mr Chairman, I suppose what's implied here is uh, well, whether Council would be of a mind to review that policy at some point in the future, and we could certainly mm. um, do that, but I, I don't, we, we wouldn't be able to do it now. Yeah. Okay, any further questions or comments, Councillor? Well, I, I'll no. just, and just further too, I think to reiterate for the Councillor that the, the policy covers legal assistance that's provided by the council. Um, it doesn't cover the, there's no mention of um, the, uh, yeah, the costs associated with an investigation. Um, the OIA have a table that is, has been created and that's sitting in there as part of the penalty um, tables that they, they've included themselves. I, I can't remember the exact wording of it, but there is a penalty table, the OIA, um, have put in place, and um, that's what we're relying upon in this recommendation, Councillor. Councillor Farrelly. Okay, there was just one other item. Um, I noticed that in the recommendation, um, when it talks to the three disciplinary proposed disciplinary actions, um, an order that the subject councillor attend training or counselling addressing his conduct in the Act it says at the councillor's expense, but I'm just wondering if there's a reason why that's not included in, is that an act, is that an, uh, as a result of an OIA recommendation or was that our, we've just copied that from OIA? That, that, that was um, taken from the OIA recommendation, so if there's a cost in respect of counselling, then um, it would naturally be applied under those circumstances. Okay. But can I just clarify, it's not the OIA that's providing these recommendations, it's the, invest it's the investigator. Okay. So. Um, and I just suppose, I, I guess when it comes to um, uh, the councillors, my understanding is that councillors have the right to... Um, 
determine the disciplinary, you know, to change those. I just, I've had a look, I've looked up 150 AH disciplinary action against a councillor. There are other options there, but I just want to um, make sure councillors are happy with what's there and they're not wanting to in, include anything else in that. Well, can I just highlight, you've just seconded the motion as it's been recommended by the investigator. Very dangerous territory to go. You didn't second it. Nick did, okay. My apology. All right. Any further comments? Put the recommendation to the vote. All in favour? Three. And Councillor Farinelli voting against. Okay. Three, Mr Chairman. I'll go and pitch the other yeah. councillors. Okay, councillors, we are up to item eight, general business. Are there any general business items? Yes. Councillor Norwood. So we are on general business, yeah, okay. Any, uh, Councillor Millwood? Through the chair. So I just want to say that I um, was just a little bit disappointed how things have played out, even though I was out of the room for the complaint. Um, I am aware that this didn't play out in the manner that I would have liked to have seen, I'm disappointed that the transparency of the full transcript that I, no, no, this is due back to what we had done in the investigation, which I'm not going to say anything about, but I'm disappointed that it was supposed to be my, my I got given a choice whether I wanted to have this fully, the whole transcript put out there for transparency and 95% of the transcript was retracted and I feel like I'm very disappointed about that and I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I also want to put out there that Tully Heads and Murray Upper Communities, I just want to let them know that the decision made in the last council meeting was not to shut the dumps, it was to reduce the opening hours of both these transfer stations to one day each on a trial basis for 12 months because it's out there that we, we're shutting them and I just want to let them know that we're not shutting them. Um, I also would like to say to all the women out there, I've got a little spiel here for International Women's Day. A strong woman accepts both compliments and criticism graciously, knowing that it takes both sun and rain for a flower to grow. Um, and I have one more thing, just a reminder to all that there are orange wheelie bins that you'll see located around the council depots, libraries and customer service centres, which are for the collection of unwanted household batteries and cordless power tool batteries. Council has teamed up with Clean Away to responsibly recy recycle these items and these bins can be found at Cardwell and Innisfail Library. Tully Civic Centre and Innisfail Shaw Hall and Tully and Innisfail Depots. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Millwood. Councillor Barnes. Oh, good. Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, firstly, I would just like to ask our CEO to please give us an update on the helipad. Uh, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the uh, question, Councillor Barnes. 
um, the uh, uh, the matter is subject to uh, legal proceedings, um, and it would be inappropriate to preempt what those uh, legal proceedings might uh, might provide. Um, the uh, <coughs> the matter ultimately will be determined by the uh, by the planning and environment court or, or three, Mr. Chairman. Is it still the planning and environment court, Mr. Goodman, or just planning court? Planning and Environment Court, yeah. So, um, in so far as it's a, a current legal proceedings, um, there's nothing more that I can say. Um, Councillor Barnes, I apologise. Oh, good. Thanks, Mr. Sear. Last meeting we did mention on the Council's policy on speaking to the public on certain matters. So, since that meeting to this meeting, I've done a study on it and I've come up with um, uh, the ins and outs of it. It reads that it's mainly for lobbyists and developers and it was pretty embarrassing that they going to that protest and um, after thinking about it a lot um, it it was the right way to play it out because even though it is only for lobbyists and developers who did I know who was in the crowd you know after a lot of thought so we did speak one meeting it was one or two meetings ago that we should revisit that one day and I suppose we will and talk about it a bit more thoroughly. And also, while we had Mr Goodman in the room, I'd just like to ask him how we're going with our um, projects where the money will be running out on the 30th of June. As I say every week, we don't want to be giving a cent back. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, thanks for the question, uh, Councillor Barnes. Uh, Councillor Barnes, uh, the uh, the project that I guess uh, provides uh, most cons most concern uh, <coughs> uh, remains uh, Upper Darragh Road uh, and the realignment of that road, uh, which is uh, will hopefully be uh, funded uh, through uh, DRFA arrangements. Uh, and uh, but is being held up through uh, land acquisition process. Uh, there are uh, a number of other projects that uh, that are, um, uh, I guess uh, we need to continue to work very uh, diligently on to ensure that uh, uh, we get we meet that uh, June 30 uh, funding uh, deadline. Um, certainly, the uh, assistance uh, uh, council provided it with the uh, uh, recent budget review uh, has allowed us to focus on those uh, projects. And uh, while those uh, other projects that council had provided internal uh, or own source uh, revenue funding for, uh, we recognise them as uh, uh, very important projects. Uh, projects that we intend to deliver. Most of those ones uh, that, that are deferred in, in the early stages of, of the next financial year, uh, deferring those projects uh, does us allow to focus in on those projects that we have external funding for and, uh, and do our very best to deliver them before June 30 and so that uh, we can utilise that external funding to its, uh, to its uh, ultimate capacity, maximum capacity I should have said. Thanks, Mr. Goodman. Uh, Councillor Farinelli. Um, through the chair. Um, with regards to general business, um, I've just got a statement that I want to make. Uh, two days ago, councillors took part in a workshop to work out on our new corporate plan. As part of that process, we discussed this council's core values, respect, integrity and courage. I'm going to embody courage by putting it on the record that I am also not satisfied with the way in which Council presented items 6.4 and 6.5 on today's agenda. The process and the time it took to get to today was long and an emotional one for many, myself included. As a councillor making a referral against another councillor is an obligation I have under the Local Government Act and Balcarra laws. Councillors also must lead by example and show respect to one and all, while also maintaining integrity when carrying out our duties. Not only is this reflected in our corporate plan, but also in our code of conduct. In the lead up to today, I went from being given a choice to having the process 
and ultimate findings and recommendations of the investigation into my complaint dealt with in a confidential setting or in an open council meeting. I was quoted local government regulation 254J that the matter may directly affect my health and safety and therefore I could have chosen, I could choose to have the matter dealt with in a confidential setting. I said no. I wanted full transparency and believed that ratepayers had a right to know the full story. And so began an undertaking to have my right for an open and transparent process taken away from me. At a councillor information session on the 2nd of February, councillors were actually shown a draft of the full report with names redacted to protect the identity of those individuals we were required to protect by law. The full reports and findings by Ashdale were to be included in the reports today, as were the transcripts in those interviews um, be interviewed, being a, counselor a council staff member and numerous councillors. Having read the full reports and all transcripts more than twice, I am not surprised that there was such an undertaking to have these documents made confidential. We were told that it was reasonable for council to de deem these reports as confidential, not necessary, for the interim, and there is no public benefit. Uh, we were also told that there was no public benefit for these their release unless council makes a re resolution to do so, and that council could consider the release of the confidential documents at the meeting. There were phone calls to the OIA and Department of Local Government Racing and Multicultural Affairs by others and myself. I pointed out to the referral agencies that it was impossible for a councillor to move a motion to make information public due to the fact that as soon as that happened, all councillors bar one, in my personal opinion, became conflicted as they either had been interviewed or implicated into interview transcripts and have reason to not want that information made public. Council staff then sought legal advice to reinforce their position and keep all reports and transcripts relating to the invest investigation confidential. I'm going to finish by saying I do respect and accept the decision of Council and that everyone has acted in accordance with the advice and information that has been provided to them using an interpretation of the law. On a personal level, I believe that I am a victim of a system that was created for Council and not by Council. Thank you, Councillor Farinelli. Any further general business, councillors? Uh, I have one that I'd like to put to the CEO. Uh, currently, there's a directive from myself about closing our council meetings to the public. Uh, that comes to a close after the next meeting in March. Um, what's the status with our internal pandemic committee about opening uh, the April meetings up and, and going forward? Could you uh, give uh, us an update on that, please? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr Chairman. With your permission, uh, the uh, instruction which you've provided to uh, myself uh, is to close meetings to the public until the end of March uh, and uh, uh, associated with that instruction was that the uh, meetings be live streamed, um, which has um, obviously occurred. Um, absent of uh, any other instruction uh, from you um, before uh, the end of March then uh, April uh, would see um, an availability for uh, the public to um, uh, to, to join uh, council um, in its meeting rooms. However, um, there are uh, a couple of issues which um, would would influence how that could operate. Um, the first one is a logistical issue, and the second one, and I note that uh, the chairman of our pandemic committees come to the front table to assist me, so um, thank you for that, Mr Sadler. Um, the first one, the logistical issue, is that uh, uh, as best as I understand it, and Mr Singh may correct me on this one, um, there's about a, a three-day uh, job involved in moving all of the audiovisual equipment from this site to the uh, the Innisfail side. If we, I know you haven't specifically asked that question, but I, uh, I note if we're continuing to live stream, uh, if we were to rotate between the two venues, then uh, on each occasion we'd need three days of our own labour and contractual labour to move the uh, audiovisual e equipment, which would come at some impost. I haven't, um, not knowing that this question was going to be asked, I haven't calculated the cost of that to council. Um, but it would be uh, significant. Uh, three, Mr Chairman, the Innisfail 
uh, meeting room is smaller than this one, um, and I'll go to um, Mr Sadler in a moment to seek his advice as to how many members of the public might be able to go to the Innisfail chamber. I suspect that it will, will the answer will be probably uh, none um, uh, through Mr Chairman. Uh, so far as I understand it, some of the preliminary comments I've heard, uh, having had this room measured and taking into account the uh, instructions with regards to uh, uh, COVID, um, that the number of uh, public participants who might enter the room would be restricted to as few as two or three or perhaps four. And on, on, on that note, I'll hand over with your permission to Mr Sadler. <coughs> Mr Sadler. Uh, thank you for the chair. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, the pandemic committee has has been looking at this for some time, um, based on the, the, the mayor's request, um, and also continuing to keep a close eye on our our risk level. Um, and there was some discussion at uh, the local disaster management group meeting yesterday as well in relation to our risk level, and working with Queensland Health on that. Um, as the CEO highlighted, that um, this room uh, had, can have a capacity of 22, and I suppose over the last few council meetings have been keeping a track on how many uh, staff and, uh, and support staff are required to, to run this, this meeting, particularly with live streaming as well. Uh, the maximum for this room at the moment is 22, based on the size and the layout of the room. Uh, and as the CEO said, um, uh, on average, we're having up to 19 uh, people in the room uh, already. So uh, I suppose, again, depends on the agenda, but on, on average, we're, we're having 19 or 20 in the room, uh, which would allow us to have two or three um, additional people in the room based on the current restrictions. Um, we have got methods of ways of doing that if council wishes to, to open that up and obviously would be looking at things like QR codes and pre-registration prior to coming in and a pandemic checklist in, in that regard. And obviously if, um, if uh, our risk level does change, then um, we would have to do something different again. Yeah. Um, in relation to uh, the Innisfail Chamber, and the CEO is correct, it is a smaller space and there is a, a different layout obviously. And um, it is unknown in relation to the layout how much uh, cabling and those type of things would be required from a audio visual point of view and obviously to continue the live streaming to do, to do that work. Um, but as the CEO highlighted, we think that um, if you're lucky, we might be able to allow one person to come into that, to that, that space. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we have in relation to an update, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sadler and Mr. Gott. Uh, given that information and the resolution that was passed at our last meeting, that we'd continue to have all our council meetings in Tully because of the cost factor of rotating between Innisfail <laughs> and Tully Chamber, uh, I would like to give an instruction that uh, first meeting in April uh, we open the Tully Chamber up to the public. Are you happy to accept that? Oh, yeah, based, through on the, Mr. based on the internal pandemic chair's uh, report. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, we'll need to install a system. Uh, clearly, it would be a major inconvenience to the public if 10 or 20 people turned up and, and only one or two were, were uh, able to, to walk into the room. So um, we'll need to install uh, a pre-registration system, as uh, Mr. Sadler uh, suggested, so that we can... Uh, uh, allow a member or two uh, or three uh, of the uh, public to attend in, in this uh, chamber. Yep, thank you, Mr. Gott. Um, one further general business item. Uh, everybody would have seen the announcement from uh, Minister Dan Tian, the Federal Tourism Minister, about the $1.2 billion for uh, reduced airfares within uh, regional Queensland. And um, I just want to uh, say that the tourism industry has been impacted by uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, the banana industry was impacted by the recent uh, visit of a tropical low, a pretty intense tropical low, I might add. Uh, and uh, as a show of support, um, I just want to hand out these face masks and ask people to consider uh, consider supporting uh, the banana industry and protecting public health uh, when you're out in uh, public events. Nice 
pieces of sensors are actually selling these face masks to try and gain some funds to run their annual event. Um, if you go on the food trail, it will be a requirement to wear a face mask. Uh, and uh, they've promoted this one to support uh, their event, but more importantly, the banana industry, who got a big whack recently. So uh, with those few words, I just wanted to put that on in the minutes and uh, ask councillors if you are going to be taking up the reduced airfares and you'll have to wear a face mask, make sure you take Cassidy Coast with you uh, and, and wear the black and yellow proudly. Uh, Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, first question, where do we get one? So we'll look into that after this because yep. um, uh, I know that... Um, I'll get one for myself and one for my wife, and I'll probably get one for the kids and their, uh, their both their partners. So. Yeah. Um, I did have a general business item, Mr Mayor, that I'd like yep. to raise. Uh, the Clean Up Australia Day events went on over the last weekend. Um, there was a major event on the Johnson River, another major event at Cowley Beach, and another one down at uh, Mission Beach around the Clump Point area. There were probably others, so if I've missed any of them... I would also not like to acknowledge uh, their efforts, um, but I really want to have acknowledged today the volunteers that turn up to these events and the organisations that run them um, on behalf of um, the, our environment uh, in this most beautiful part of the, uh, the very heart of the wet tropics and the birthplace of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Um, there's some fantastic efforts going to place, and I do believe we need to acknowledge our staff in delivery services and in waste services who provide fantastic support to these events. And um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, the North Australia Cleanup will be running in September or October. So people can come along, bring your Feast of the Census face mask, some gloves, pick up sticks and come and give us a hand. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Barnes. Uh, just lastly, Mr Mayor, at the disaster management meeting held yesterday, there was a major talk, I won't go into the numbers too much, on the COVID coming out of New Guinea that's affecting mm. Cairns. The hospital's got many, many cases. Uh, and it was a major talking point of the meeting. Also a major talk point of the meeting was the breakdown of the internet services with the blow we had. Um, major talks, the pressure is going to be put on those proprietors of those companies to pick their battery power up in case something like that ever happens again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Councillor Millwood? Yes, yeah, sorry, the Chair. I just want to clarify with my um, opinion earlier on, I do respect that whatever decision has been made by Council in item 6.4 and 6.5. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Millwood. That's noted. Um, on a very positive note, uh, the previous council and this council and our staff have worked tirelessly to deliver an RV facility uh, at Hadrill Park uh, and I can tell you with uh, some glee, um, Shed Boss is on site today uh, installing uh, the caretaker shed. So action aplenty uh, and that's a good news story uh, given that we're heading into our tourism uh, season and CMCA obviously have got the ball rolling now because they want to capture what will be a huge domestic uh, market given COVID restrictions down south and people wanting to get out and uh, enjoy uh, uh, Queensland. So uh, that's a good news story about uh, Shed Boss on site at Hadrill Park. Any, uh, Councillor Millwood? Through the Chair, on that note, I think Tully Caravan Park is on its way as well. Absolutely. Any further general business? If not, I'll declare the meeting closed at 10.25. Thank you.